seek, 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 seek. Seek, seek, I'm speaking to you. Welcome you all. I hope you're healthy and fine. Yes, one more time for you all. Hello, hello, hello. Testing. All right.
All right, let's try that. Very good. The Path Jesus Walked at Villa Del Rosa. What a beautiful tune. Welcome to worship today. We here are meeting in person. We're on Facebook and we're on Zoom. Welcome to all those on the internet, friends. Uh, please know, as always, the comments and the chats are being monitored. Please feel free to participate in that way. Also, if there are prayer requests that you'd like to include, please include them and they, we will uh, collate them in the middle of our service as we normally do. We have a few announcements to be made. Uh, the first one is Easter lilies. Their order forms are in the, uh, the entryway for those who are here. And also, if you'd like to order Easter lilies to decorate the sanctuary and your homes after Easter Sunday, please contact the office if you need help with that. But those will be available for the next few weeks. Uh, in addition... Women's study, Monday evenings or Wednesday mornings, are starting back up again after Easter, uh, beginning April 12th, and they, are, they plan to meet in person and Zoom to have a, a hybrid options for those who, uh, to meet as many needs as we can. We'll be studying about Proverbs 31 and the, uh, talking about uh, the biblical uh, picture of womanhood. Also, there's an Easter egg hunt. It is the same, but different. Children and youth, ages 2 through 12th grade, are invited to a Easter egg hunt March 21st from 1 to 1, from 1 to 1.30 at the McLean's house on Fawn Valley Drive, just across from the high school. And what you need to know is bring your own basket and dress for the weather as we will be outside. And please contact Tina Ritchie or the church office for any additional questions. Um, let's see, we have a very important announcement. Before COVID, we had what was called a grief share class, and that was an opportunity to share about uh, loss in, in, the form, in, in the context of a group. And that was very important and a special moment for many of us. That is starting back up again. Hannah Hall is uh, taking uh, uh, taking class members. <laughs> That's what she's organizing the class. If you'd like to contact her, she's starting up a grief share class. If you've done that before, she's looking at uh, the folks that have, have done the class before to revitalize that that class. She's also st considering starting an entire new one excuse me, new one as well. So please look for that, and there's more information in your bulletin, and uh, you certainly can call the church office for any other information. And lastly, we do have a sermon discussion every Sunday except for communion Sundays. The information is on Zoom, and you can find that on the, in the chats in Zoom. With that, let us remember that this is the day the Lord has made, and let's rejoice as we worship together. We're going to start off with our moment for household worship with Tina Ritchie. Good morning, everyone. Today we are talking about patience and gentleness. And to help us discover a deeper meaning towards both of these words, I decided to look into Strong's Greek Dictionary. And what I discovered is that this kind of patience that we are talking about comes from two different Greek words. The first is hupomone which means to persevere, remain under, uh, bearing up under, and refers to the quality of character which does not allow one to surrender to circumstances or to succumb under trial. This type of patience is endurance in relation to uh, things or circumstances. Now the second word, macrothumia, particularly relates to patients with people. And it means to be long-suffering, forbearance, to have self-restraint before proceeding to action. So we need to have patience in all of these areas with people, with our circumstances, and with things. And so I ask you, where is it hard for you to be patient? Is it just one of these areas? Is it two or is it all three? For some examples, think about, is it hard for you to wait your turn? Is it hard for you to stand in line? Is it hard for you to listen to others when you have something that you want to say? 
Or do you become frustrated or impatient with people when they're not listening to you or not trying to understand what you are saying? So this week, reflect on where you become impa impatient and how you can cultivate the fruit of patience in your life. Now to help you, we're gonna look at the word gentleness. And gentleness comes from the Greek word praotes, which means meekness or gentle strength, which expresses power with reserve and gentleness. Um, this is not denoting an outward expression of feeling, but an inward grace of the soul and in particular, it's calmness toward God. Now, I love that gentleness comes from the word meekness, which is strength under control. I don't normally think about gentle and meekness as about being strength, but it is. It's strength under control. And Jesus demonstrated this so beautifully for us. Um, this means that it takes strength and power to stay in control, to be gentle. Um, we have to coordinate many, many parts of ourselves to remain calm and gentle um, so as not to harm others or ourselves. So I'm gonna give you a different kind of an example to think about this. When you go to lift a heavy object, you have to coordinate many different muscle groups so as not to hurt yourself or maybe someone else who's helping you. You have to use your abdominal muscles to protect your, your lower back. You want to make sure that you're using your arms and your upper back in, a, in the proper way, that you want to make sure that you're bending your knees and using the power in your legs. All of these things work together for you to safely accomplish your task. Gentleness is like that too. We have to harness our power so that we can remain patient and thoughtful in our actions. Now it is important to consider that we need patience to, to have gentleness and we need to have gentleness to have patience. Uh, like all of the fruit of the Spirit, they work together and support one another to help us become more Christ-like. I want to leave you with two short memory verses this week. Think about Psalm 37 7 which says, Be patient and wait for the Lord to act. And Philippians 4, 5, that says, let your gentleness be known to everyone. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for showing gentleness toward us. Please help us be gentle and considerate of others and also to be patient and trust in you. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Have a great week. Okay, thank you, Tina. Would you join me on the bowl in the call to worship, please? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble. And gather in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some are sick through their sinful ways. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. <laughs> he sent out his word and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. And thank the Lord that love works to human can. And let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. Our opening prayer. Lord, as we come from the routine of the week, give us sufficient grace to take off our masks and dare to be open and honest with you here and with each other so that your grace may abound in our lives. Amen. Amen. At the center of the law is God's love. What we might see as divine nonsense is shown in becoming human for our sake. What we see as weakness, which defeats the strongest powers, this love 
This grace is of more value to, to us than all the stocks in our pension fund. Let us open ourselves to such love as we open our hearts to confess our sin to God. Friends, let's pray in silence. Will you join with me in the prayer of confession? Let us pray. God of holy majesty, we lift our hearts and eyes to you, acknowledging that we have disobeyed your holy law. We have been sorely wounded by our sin and call upon you to bind us up. Have mercy upon us in our distress. Heal us, restore us, shine your light into our darkness. Be glorified in us and through us, that with gladness of heart we may testify of your merciful kindness and steadfast love to us. Help us by your Spirit to bear witness to your healing grace, restoring mercy, wherever we find brokenness and ruin, through Jesus Christ, our saving Lord. Wholeness comes through God's amazing love for us and for the world. We are healed in order to bring healing to our world. We are strengthened in faith so we might be spent for others. We are set free from the bondage of sin to become servants of Christ. Amen. Our prayer for illumination. Dear God, all that we have learned and think we know has not brought meaning to our lives. Our broken world needs your peace. Our pain-shattered hearts need your healing. So speak to us through your word, and may our ears be open. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson comes from Psalms 103, 8 through 10, and Micah 7, 18 through 19. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of your possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in showing clemency. He will again have compassion upon us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. This is the word of the Lord. Don't get it right Where I talk, we talk it I don't walk and miss The moments right before my eyes 
Somebody with a hurt I could have helped Somebody with a hand I could have helped And I just can't see past myself Lord, help me to be a little more like mercy A little more like grace A little more like kindness Goodness, love and faith A little more like patience A little more like peace a little more like Jesus, a little less like me. Well, there's no denying I have changed. I've been saved from who I used to be. But even at my best, I must confess, I still need help to see in the way you see. Somebody with a hurt, I could have helped. Somebody with a hand, I could have helped. And I just can't see past myself, Lord. Help me to be a little more like mercy, a little more like grace. A little more like kindness, goodness, love, and faith. A little more like patience. A little more like peace. A little more like Jesus. A little less like me. Oh, be the beggar on the street. Would love to be your hands and feet. Freely give what I receive, Lord. Help me. I want to put you first above all else To love my name and raise myself In the moments no one sees, Lord Help me to be One, two, three A little more like mercy A little more like grace A little more like kindness Goodness, love and faith a little more like patience, a little more like peace, a little more like Jesus, a little less like me, a little more like living in everything I preach, a little more like Jesus, a little less like me. The New Testament lesson is in, from Matthew 23, 37, and Ephesians 4, 1 through 2. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love. The word of the Lord. What I'm going to share with you today it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard because as I was thinking about this, it is hard for me to consider being patient and gentle. So I imagine, but also it's not just being patient and gentle in the way we might imagine, but being patient and gentle in the way Jesus is. Oh, and that is hard. <laughs> So I want to tell you a story. Many of you know, I'm going to be telling you two stories about my grandmother, who is probably, at least I've seen her be patient and gentle in ways that are incredible. 
The first story, uh, I, I lived with my grandmother for three years. Our family moved in after Grandpa died, and we were caretakers, and uh, sort of at that point she didn't need too much caretaking. But uh, it was really remarkable to live in this house that my mother had grew up in, and actually my grandmother had grew up in that house as well. But there was a little garage underneath the house, and the one time it rained every year, this is in, in Los Angeles, it only rains once a year. Uh, the garage would flood, and it was a big mess, and so I decided, you know, I'm going to clean it out. And of course, it had not been cleaned out in years, and there was a b bunch of silt on the bottom of it, and so we, we took everything out of the garage, found a few treasures, found a lot of trash, cleaned out the garage, and I noticed in the back of, of the garage, in the cement, there were little footprints, and I said, Grandma, you've got to tell me, wh whose footprints are these? And she says, oh, it was many, 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 many years ago. My mother was at elementary school, and my uncles were running around the house barefoot. And the workmen had been asked to come in to lay a slab for the, the, the garage. The garage was already built. It had been dirt, and they, they were laying the, the slab. So they poured the cement in, and my grandmother was attending to her youngest son, who was a baby, and the two other rascals were uh, all over the place. And next thing you know, she goes down to the, the garage to check on the, uh, on the curing of the cement, and there's the footprints there. And she gets so upset because she thought that her little uh, lovely children had ruined the cement. She called the contractor and said, I'm, I'm so sorry, you need to come and fix it. And, and the contractor said, calm down, calm down. You, you, you need to have a little patience and gentleness here because what you think is terrible and, and ruinous right now will be worth more than gold in a few years. And she was right. The contractor was right. It was absolutely incredible to see the little footprints of, of my uncles in the cement. But that's the value of this patience and this gentleness that we're talking about. And if we're going to define, I, I think, actually, Tina sort of preached the whole sermon right there. We could just go home right there. I think it was really well done. But if we really want to define patience and gentleness, at least for today, in these few minutes, I think patience is approaching adverse conditions whether they're you know, of all kinds, without anger. And gentleness is approaching adverse conditions without aggression. Patience without anger, gentleness without aggression. And of course, I think, as we've been going through all these fruits of the Spirit in this season of Lent, It feels like to me that these are like alloys that are put together to make a better, stronger, more useful tool. Because patience by itself, well, we can be very patient, but also we can, in many ways, allow our patience to um, turn into other things like apathy or avoidance, and the same thing with gentleness. But if we add these things together and culminate everything with love, I think we really are exhibiting this example of Jesus. So first, patience. I want to make something very clear. Patience isn't the absence of anger. When we read in what Sue just read in Psalm 103, the Lord is merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. There are lots of stories in the Old Testament where God is angry. Are, and some of those are, are a little scary. It is not that God is not angry. It is that He is slow to anger. It, the capacity, patience has a lot to do with capacity, of the, the point of when we really do need to express our anger is greater the more patience we have. And, of course, we read in Micah 
Who is God like? Pardoning iniquity, passing over transgression. It is patience that tempers our anger, causing it to be slow to come about and quick to dissipate. That is patience. And we find that in the character of God. Now, gentleness being this way of approaching adverse conditions without aggression. That's an interesting thing. We think about gentleness as being, um, well, <laughs> okay, this is the example I thought of this morning, and it's just a lot of fun. Applying gentleness is like changing a diaper. That is an adverse condition. Yuck! Do you blame the child? Do you get angry? No, that's useless. Do, are you rough? Changing? No, you want to be gentle. This is part of, this is an example of how we, how we should treat each other, how we should, we should go about life. Although it seems like babies are easy to be patient and gentle with most of the time. I do remember one child where I had to, at three in the morning, don't throw the baby out the window. Don't throw the baby out the window. That because he had been up for, I don't know, 20 hours screaming? Yikes. Um, but gentleness, I think, has to do with empathy. And the reason why I say that is because even in our Scripture today, in Ephesians, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I, I the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling, with all humility and gentleness. And we find the words of Jesus, come unto me, all you who are weary. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, because I am humble in heart and gentle. So Jesus connects these two as well. And humility has a great deal about putting other people first. And I think gentleness, if you consider the baby once again, that is the classic example of putting another first. Oh, and you have to. That's what parenthood calls you to do. Gentleness when we approach situations with gentleness, we are being empathetic. We're recognizing who that other person is what, or the circumstances of the surroundings, and we're being open to how, uh, how that other person might, uh, might react or might, where they might be coming from. Now, just like patience, gentleness is at least in the examples of Jesus, is not being a doormat. It is tempering, tempering truth in order to express something gently. I was applying for a job in a church in Texas. And they, you know, I went down there, I visited, I, I, we thought we were really uh, on top of the list. And then we got a call from one of the elders of the church. And, oh, man, he, what he had to say was, I'm sorry, we're not going to hire you. But he did it so gently and so honestly that I felt good afterwards. <laughs> and maybe it's just because that's how you do it in Texas. I don't know. But he had something that was difficult to do, and he did it gently. When Jesus, in the fourth chapter in John, he is sitting by the well and the Samaritan woman comes up. He's talking to her and he is addressing her lifestyle. She's been married five times and the one that she's with now isn't her husband. There's something going on there that's not good nor healthy. And he addresses it. Gently. And there are tons of times in Scripture where Jesus does this. It is not, gentleness is not avoiding what needs to be said or done. It is tempering what needs to be said or done. 
just like patience is tempering our anger, our, uh, or, what it, or, or the truth that needs to come out. But in patience, in gentleness, especially when we find in 2 Peter, and the reason I bring up 2 Peter is the letter that Peter the Apostle wrote. He suggests there, there's, there's about three things we should do in patience. First of all, we need not to be surprised. Friends, in this world, your patience will be tried. It will be. For those of you who know the uh, fantastic uh, um, script of the movie Princess Bride, life is pain, princess. Anyone saying anything different is trying to sell you something. Your patience will be tried. Jesus says persecution is a given. So we shouldn't be surprised when this fruit of patience needs to be exhibited in our lives. Secondly, as Christians, we are not to retaliate in kind. In fact, in this family, this household of God, what we are called to respond with is always the same thing, and that is love. And that takes a lot of patience because we are programmed <laughs> naturally to respond in kind. We are programmed naturally to fly off the hook. We are programmed naturally to be vindicated, to, uh, to want revenge, to run away. And then lastly, Peter suggests that patience really what God is calling us to do is one, you know, and I told you all these fruits of the Spirit are really alloys coming together. There's one, faithfulness, there's goodness, there's kindness, all those we've been talking about these last few weeks. A lot of it is to stick in it, to stay. And when you, especially when you're talking about persecution, when you're talking about circumstances that are difficult, wow, don't give up. That's patience. When our faith calls us to do something that is a struggle, when our faith calls us to stay in a situation, a place, uh, to maintain a conviction, that's patience. And doing it winsomely, maybe in a, in a, in a job situation, where you are trying your best to be uh, full of integrity, to be truthful, to be honest, and there, you've got circumstances in your job situation that doesn't help you do that. What are we called to do to be patient and to stick with our convictions of our faith? Now, it was also interesting that uh, Tina suggested that there's two sides to patience, and that's right. With patience, there's also the sense of forgiveness. How many times are we supposed to forgive each other? Seven times 70. You can do the math, but what Jesus really meant was all the time. As Christians especially, we're to bear each other's burdens. And many times, those burdens can be when a brother and sister, when a neighbor is hurting us. And that can be... Ex I, I told you this was tough. The real ramifications of this, this is very difficult and very hard. But we are supposed to bear these things as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, how do we do this? We look at the example of Christ. Christ. Jesus died on the cross so that sins could be forgiven. If we are trying to exhibit patience, especially with people who are difficult, especially with people who wound us. And, uh, and by the way, that's going to happen. That is going to be hap happening. John Lennon was not correct. The love that you give is not the love that you get. 
the love that you give is directly proportionate to the opportunity people have to injure you. Does that make love not worth it? No, it does. It's, it's all worth it. But patience, how do we bear these things? And that is acknowledging that in Christ we are forgiven. That Christ bears the shame and our pain and our sin so that when we have to forgive others, we can let those things go. Acknowledging patience and gentleness just as Christ offers us patience and gentleness. I told you about Peter. If you can imagine, especially on Monday, Thursday, Jesus is arrested. He's taken to the house of the high priest. There's, there's a, 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 a jury, a trial that's illegal. It's frustrating and wrong. And Peter and John sneak into the courtyard to, just to keep tabs, just to be close. And Peter is asked, hey, you were with that, that, uh, that Galilean. You, you, no, no, I wasn't. And, and he denies with more and more veracity that he never knew Jesus. Now, the hard part is, Jesus was right there. Jesus was not in the courtroom. He was right there. He heard Jesus. John was right there. Excuse me. Jesus heard Peter. John heard Peter. Deny everything. Curse himself. No way. I don't know this guy. As Jesus is on trial. Can you imagine the betrayal? I mean, yes, yes. This is the Son of God. Yes, He is perfect. But did that feel good? No. Skip a couple pages and we're at the beach. And you can imagine where Jesus has a breakfast on the beach. They've been fishing all night. They come in and Peter wants to draw near. But you can imagine that distance because Peter knows what he did. And Jesus didn't have to be the divine Son of God to know what he did because he was there. And how does Jesus respond? Peter, love my sheep. In this beautiful, gentle recalibration of the relationship. That is who Jesus is. Now, I told you I had another story about my grandmother. We lived about two and a half hours away. So when we, when my family stayed at grandma's house, we stayed for a day or two or, or more because it was just to make the trip worth it. And there, you know, there, there, we, we would hang out in the neighborhood, play with the kids in the neighborhood, and it was easy because, hey, we're here for Christmas, we're here for Thanksgiving, and then, hey, see you next year. And um, there was a young man in the neighborhood who uh, developed a reputation. And one day, well, among one of the things, his, he was a young man at this time, uh, and his uh, parents decided to go on a cruise or you know, figured that, hey, he's old enough to feed himself. He can stay home for a, for a couple of days. Well, he, he had a nice big house with no parents in it, and he invited... Uh, several hundred of his closest friends. Uh, there were so many people that I think the, the wooden deck was about ready to collapse. Uh, you could hear the music for miles, and who knows what other things went on there. But that was just one of the things. He was a little bit of a wild child. But when I had moved into Grandma's house, just after Grandpa had died, there were, you know, lots of people would come in and visit Grandma just, just to give their condolences. And this young man, who wasn't, he was, he was a young man by that time, he was mid-twenties, came to visit. First of all, I was shocked because I knew this kid is, is the 
the little neighborhood kid, you know, I barely recognized him. But he came to visit my grandmother and to express his, his uh, condolences. But then he also said, Mrs. Moffat, thank you. Thank you for always having time for me. Thank you for letting me into your house and, and visiting with me whenever I needed it. And he went on and on. And I was flabbergasted. One, I had no idea my grandmother did that. But that's patience and gentleness. Being open constantly, even to the, the crazy kid in the neighborhood who was constantly in trouble. And there's the payoff, too. And of course, it's the same beautiful thing that we find in our relationship with Jesus. It's that patience and that gentleness. Even when we screw it up so poorly, it is that same welcome we receive in Christ. So friends, this week, this life, how can we nurture patience and gentleness in our lives and in the lives of each other? Thanks for listening. God bless you. is called Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. I hope you enjoy.
<clears throat> Our affirmation of faith comes from the study of Catechism of the PCUSA. Question 27. Does your confession of God as creator contradict the findings of modern science? The confession of God as creator answers three questions. How and why? of sharing love and freedom. Natural science has much to teach us the particular mechanisms and process of nature, but is not in a position to answer these questions about ultimate reality. It contradicts the findings of modern science nor does anything essential to modern science contradict the Christian faith. I would be happy to take any prayer requests we have for those in the sanctuary, and we'll be looking, looking for those uh, prayer requests that we have online. But are there any prayer requests now? Yes. Alzheimer's, and my sister Linda uh, has had uh, has had surgery on her bowels this past week. And all the people that are taking care of all these people down in Indiana. Very good. So we have Dan who has Parkinson's and struggling with dementia, Herman with strokes and Alzheimer's, and is uh, needing a, a facility to live in, and Linda who's had surgery. And for caregivers of all these people. Are there others, friends? Well, we have those who have joined us online. Please keep these prayers in, in your prayers this week. Uh, please uh, pray for Ed Schwartz, who's continually uh, in the process of healing from surgery, and Bob. Please pray for Savaria, Savaria and Kyle to continue to have a healthy pregnancy. Please pray for 14-year-old Michaela, who is having complications, relearning to walk, strength and guidance for her parents as they uh, try to provide for her and, and deal with the struggles. And please pray that patience and gentleness prevail for our country in seeking ways to come together and heal. For those struggling with mental, is mental issues, and we pray for them for healing and peace. We pray for all workers giving COVID vaccinations. And we also pray for Jen Wenzel for continued healing and strength for her broken ankle. Friends, please keep all these things in your prayers this week as we, the family of God, support each other. Pardon? Thank you. And let's... Let's remember Wild Hungerford, who's now in Wellbridge and in Jack Allen. Let's keep them in our prayers as well. Sue, will you pray for us? God in heaven, we pray to you as an and yet people. 
The world goes not well, and yet we lift our prayers to you in faith. Violence and turmoil are rampant, and yet we pray for your peace and pledge to uphold justice in our lives and society. There are people who are made in your image, who suffer from the lack of food and shelter, and yet we trust in your provision and care. We do this because we have all heard of your love for us and the world. We have all witnessed your goodness in our lives and our community. We have all felt your kind touch as you pierce our darkness with your care. Will you reveal your love for us and our world today? We lift up to you our prayers. We pray especially this day for those among us in need of hope. We pray for those who have recently lost a job or are unable to find another. We pray for those who struggle with depression. We pray for those who have had suicidal thoughts and pray that they might be reminded how precious they are to you and to us. We pray for those who wrestle with addiction's fierce grip. We pray for those who have been hurt by the church. We pray for those within the church who seek to welcome others. We pray for the members of this congregation who are healing from surgery. We lift all these things up to you because you hear our voices, and so we pray as your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come and thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. represent our willingness to deny ourselves so others might be blessed by your grace, your peace, as well as your hope in every moment of their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we consider the gifts we can give to the church, I wanted to share with you two opportunities. The first is, please uh, look out for further information about the Deacon's Easter Project. They are making Easter baskets, and there's instructions and examples in the, the, uh, the entryway there. Uh, also remember that there are different levels. You can go shopping for baskets. There's about $10 is, is the general price for a basket, and we have a, a shopping list. But also, you could donate money toward those things or in, in, other, uh, in other however you'd like. In addition, you can also help build the baskets, and there's more information on our website, but also in the bulletin information there, too. In addition, I'm kind of excited, the Boy Scouts, well, sorry, the Scouts, they're, they're not just boys anymore, but the Scouts are doing something exciting to try to encourage uh, veterans, especially Vietnam veterans. We are making paracord bracelets, and that is a, a project that is just designed to be encouraging and it's kind of fun little crafty thing to take seven feet of paracord and make it into a bracelet that's uh, stylish and attractive we'll be doing that the, the scouts will be doing that on friday this friday at 
6.30 to 9 o'clock, I think. Is that right, Mike? Do you remember? Is that correct? Okay. And you certainly welcome to be a part of that, but if you'd like some paracord and do that sort of thing at home, I can supply you with that in a day or two as soon as the Amazon box comes. So that's something exciting that we can do to encourage, especially our, our veterans in our community. So that's something exciting. But friends, we have our song, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Let's sing that together as we close our worship. Brothers and sisters, do not forget that you are part of God's covenantal community. Therefore, bravely share God's enduring love this week. Know always that Christ is alive in you. So share Christ's enduring light into the shadows of uncertainty this week. Now this moment, in every moment to come, remember as a child of God, you are gifted by the Spirit. Share those gifts of grace, of hope, of justice, of peace, of gentleness, of patience, of love to everyone you meet this week. And go in peace. Amen.